real. It's relevant. It's life. It's the Power for Living show with the empowerment doctor, Tori L. Anthony. Good evening, family, and thank you for tuning in to the Powerful Living Radio Show with your host, the Empowerment Dr. Tori L. Anthony. I'm so pleased that you decided to tune in today and take time out of your busy schedule to listen to our show. This evening, I am delighted to bring to you the topic, Case Dismissed, with this being March and Resurrection Sunday right around the corner. I wanted to talk about something that had to do with the resurrection, but first, with the death of Jesus Christ. Christ. I want to talk today. I want to read a brief scripture from John, the 19th chapter. It says, then Pilate had Jesus taken and whipped. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and dressed him in a purple robe over and over. They went up to him and said, greetings, king of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Now I want to drop down to verse eight. It says, when Pilate heard this word, he was even more afraid. He went back into the residence and spoke to Jesus. Where are you from? Jesus didn't answer. So Pilate said, you won't speak to me. Don't worry. Don't you know that I have authority to release you and also to crucify you. Jesus replied, you will have no authority over me if it had not been given to you from above. That's why the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. From the moment, from that moment on, Pilate wanted to re- release Jesus. However, the Jewish leaders cried out saying, if you release this man, you aren't a friend of the emperor. Anyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes the empire. Well, today we don't have Jesus here with, well, we do have Jesus here with us, but we have someone modern day who was arrested and taken captive And the case has been dismissed. And we just wanted to share with you this evening and allow him to share his story. We have all the way from California with us today, Mr. Obi. Obi? How you doing this evening? Good. Good. Welcome to the Powerful Living Radio Show. We just wanted to take some time out and talk about you for you to share with our listening audience your experience and about being released and the case being dismissed. Um, one question that we did want to start off with first, please tell our listening audience how old you were when you were first arrested. Um, when I was first arrested, I was at, I was 18 years old. Um, I was arrested back in 1994 for the crime of murder robbery, and I was I was charged and I was convicted of that crime, and I was sentenced to the term of life without the possibility of parole plus 50 years. Wow! How long was your initial trial process, and when did you enter the California Department of Corrections? Um, my initial, um, my, my stand in, um, California, uh, men's facility, county facility was 22 months. My, my trial lasted all of, um, 30 days. However, um, during the course of that, during the, during the course of those 22 months, I then had a, a public defender who set out to do, uh, his work in regards to, uh, investigating of case and things of that nature. So it, I stayed in there for a period of 22 months, all told. Okay. Can you explain briefly a few of the events that led to your incarceration? Well, um, back in 1994, March of 1994, um, March 26th, no, excuse me, March 27th, um, a young man and his friends had approached, um, had went out for drinks uh, afterwards. After going out for drinks, they ended up, one of the young men spotted a friend of theirs out on the corner. They pulled over to approach this, this young lady on the corner. Um, one, I guess the conversation, one thing led to another. Uh, the young lady walked off, apparently. Uh, the, the Hispanic guy was a Hispanic male who had uh, ended up finding him away, finding his way to this building, which was a brothel. And uh, after he uh, was told that the young lady was busy, he walks away from the, from the door. And then you hear... Uh, 
you hear a bunch of scuffling and and and, and, and back and forth, and then you hear gunshots. Then afterwards, uh, then afterwards, you see uh, 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 you hear uh, individuals in the background making talks and conversations of that nature. So, the crime happened itself on March twenty seventh of of nineteen ninety four. They uh they charged they charged me with this case in June of that same year. They uh I was currently incarcerated for another crime already, an unrelated charge. Uh they called me down to the men's facility to book in front, told me that I was being charged with a murder and three attempted murders with three attempted three attempted robberies with special circumstances. And so at that point it was like, um, I was man, are you sure you got the right guy? Or is that the right booking number? You know, all of those questions there. And then, um, and they was like, sure, yeah, we, this is the right booking number, this and that, and I end up going to Raymond. So it was at that point that I had became aware that, uh, I had been accused of being involved in a murder robbery in which I had no knowledge of. Okay, let me m- make sure that I'm understanding you correctly. Am I understanding correctly that you were already incarcerated when this took place? No, not when the crime itself took place. The crime itself took place March 27th. Okay. I I was incarcerated for an unrelated event on April 20th of that of the next of the next month, April 20th. Okay. Um, during the, during my stay there for that for that um, unrelated charge, they called me back down to the men facility and charged me again. Some three months later, sometime in June, they ended up charging me with this murder robbery, and it, that's when I find at that point. That's when I found out that uh all of these things that was going on, so. Okay. Um, as a young man incarcerated with older, experienced convicts, can you tell us how you were treated? Well, you know, um, you know, amongst those individuals who, you know, where I was at, you know, you, you treated as fairly as you can be expected to be treated. And what I mean by that is this, is it, it all depends on how you carry yourself. So you carry yourself... And a manner in which how you know you are there, but you're not supposed to be there. So your quest is to try to get out of there. So you surrounding yourself with those kind of characters, and so then that means that the attitude and the thinking of those individuals are like yours. Then you you kind of steer away from the the conventional problems of the institution that may go on on an everyday on an everyday basis. And so it's, it, again, it's always about the company you keep. But oftentimes in prison, is you know things happen. And there's dangers at all times, and you, you try your best to try to avoid them. But it's, you know, per se, for us, you know, how one in, inmate treats another inmate, you know, again, it's, it depends on the company that you keep. If you surround yourself around individuals that are bullies, and you are the bully, you mm-hmm. know, you're the one that they bully, you know, then you know you're you're there, and it's not you, you you're almost playing a part of. It. You know that those individuals there are bullies. And you know if they've been bullying on you for this point here, why keep going back to that type of surroundings? You know what I mean? Right. And so uh, it's always about the company that you keep. So, Okay. How long did you serve in the system? 17 years I was in the system. 17, 17. years. So you yeah. went in when you were 18. You spent 17 years there. So basically you grew up in the criminal justice system. Yes. Yes, basically. And, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, now – and now that I sit back and I think about things and I try to put things in perspective and and try to get some understanding and clarity from the from the events that transpired the, over the course of years of my life, I uh, I realized, man, that uh, 17 years of my life I was back and forth from one location to the next, un with any with, with no real stability and but in, and running the streets and giving in the streets my attention, and then for the other 17 years of my life I was incarcerated. And during that time there, during the time I was in which I was incarcerated for a crime which I didn't commit, there was there was an awakening, there was a realization, there was an reckoning that that transpired within my thinking and within my spirit that that kind of that, that brought me back, that gave that, that brought me back towards the direction in which my secret, which my creator is, and so, um, you know, it was it was, it was it, there was a transformation that transpired in regards to that, and and it was a, it was a good one. 
Wow. Okay, you just said something, but I want to take a second and give the phone number for other listeners to be able to call in if they have questions. That phone number is 314-880-0808. Again, that's 314-880-0808. And also, we have an 800 number that you can call, which is 1-877-920-WGNU, which is 9460, that you can call in if you have questions for OB or for myself this evening. But, Obi, you just said something. You said that for 17 years of your life, you were running around with no stability. You right. really was going from place to place, per se. Right. And then you turned around and said that for the next 18 years, yeah. you were incarcerated, but there was an awakening. Yes, there was. How, it was um... how awesome is that that? You understand that the first 17 years you were just going from place to place, really no stability. But the right. next 18 years, you were somewhere where you there was an awakening with you and your creator. It, right. it, that that just did something to me because that makes me begin to realize that sometimes he has to separate us or cause us to be put somewhere basically to protect us and take us out of harm's way. But in fact, to build a relationship with him. So right. if I'm hearing you correctly, your real relationship with the creator was not built until he put you somewhere for 18 years. Absolutely. And it was it, and, and this is a, this this is the conclusion in which. I have come to after much, much so searching after after much, much seeking in, in regards to you know how and how was I placed into a situation in which he knew that I was not in, I was not guilty of. I knew that I was not guilty of, and so then that for me then means that what purpose then did I have for being in a place that I was surrounded by every backstabbers, liar, liars, killers, and all sorts of different individuals that had you know that that was had no good up to the in, in their in their sleeves, and so then. It was for me questioning what what is my what what is what is going on what why am I going to this place and so uh, for me it was like well I better sit down and calm myself so that I can so that I can start seeing and hearing exactly that which he is speaking unto me and uh and it wasn't until then man that I realized man that that oftentimes our our life and the choices that we make dictates those things that transpired powers and thought I didn't understand. At that point, that and it was maybe because I I was going on in my life believing and not knowing, and it's a difference between the two. And when I stopped believing in the Creator and understood and knew that He is, I then can become I can then declare things and state things and do those things and as He has powered me to do. Wow. And so, uh, and it was and, and again, but that came from much 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 reading and much soul searching and much sitting down and much calming myself within my thoughts and within my spirit and opening myself to have some kind of communication between him and I so that I can get clarity clarity as to why am I sitting here? Why am I in this prison for a crime in which I did not commit? What is it that I, what is it that is that you have up for me? And I understood that it was a refining time. It was a time for me to go through that fire, go through these trials and tribulations to strengthen myself, to realize that I was worth more than what I was given unto myself, realize that there was a power that was that was given unto me from him to help me deal with the deal with being in a situation that I'm not supposed to be in first and foremost, but also grow and be productive in my spirit and also in my actions and thoughts. And so, um, he he touched me. He touched me in a manner in which which gave me who I am now, which made me who I am today. So, okay, you just said something else. You said there's a difference in believing and knowing. Yes. Can 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 you help the list the radio audience understand the difference in believing and knowing? Well, the difference, the major difference is this: is that, and I, I give people analogies. And so, in the beginning, you believe that you understand math until you sit down and apply the application which is given to you. And then, when the test come and you pass, now you say, "Yeah, I know math." So you no longer know. You no longer have to believe whether or not you know the answer to this to this equation, you know that you do. Mm -hmm. And so when you go from believing and knowing, there is the certainty that's in there. And then when you go into knowing, there is a surety that's happening in there. And in there, and in that assurance right there, what happens is that a declaration happens where you can begin to start declaring things as our, as our Messiah told us to speak those things into existence, speak as though they already are. And so now 
it, it, it empowers you. It gives you that. It gives you that authority because you go. You, it's a transition. You believe that you can do it, and as long as it's all, it always go back to saying this: If I continue to say I'm gonna try to do something, then that's what I'm gonna live my life doing, trying to do it. But at the moment I say this is what I'm doing, those things will manifest themselves within my reality because my thought and my spirit is moving towards it. So wow, it's funny that you said that because I just recently had a discussion with someone, and I told them the same exact thing: As long as you speak damnation into your situation, that's right. how your situation is going to end. It's not until the fact that you begin to believe that your situation is totally something different, even though you don't see it at the moment. It's not right. until that fact that it kicks in that it becomes something different because you're speaking that thing into the atmosphere, and once you speak it. It has to happen, right? You have given, and you have given it birth, and now well, that's that's why I, I try to also talk about a lot. Is, is just that is this, is that the moment we give thought to something that is impure, we have allowed the devil to captivate our thoughts, and then he manifests those things within our actions because now our thoughts are captivated around what it is that's transpiring, and so it's it's up to us to defend ourselves from that. And so I tell people all the time, don't let the devil captivate your thoughts. Wow. Take control of that. Wow. Understand that you are that you have way more power than what you understand. Wow. Realize that. And so and they and they wonder well, how can you talk like that? I said, because listen, I have because I have been and they have I have been given this information and so I'm giving it to you. Wow. To let you know that you are and that you can be more. And that's what helped me. And that's why I'd be like, Well, how was I able to deal with those years? Being incarcerated, I told him there's a couple of things that happened for me. Before I went, when I was sitting in the, in the men's county jail, I remember reading a scripture that told me, it said that the innocent will be vindicated. Wow. Amazing. Wow. That was amazing. That was amazing because at the time, it was like for me, I was like, I was unlearned. I was unread and I was, I was, I, I was, I was just lost in, in, in running around doing nothing within my thoughts, within my spirit, and within my physical, I was doing nothing. And so I was like a zombie. And so then when I'm, when I'm reading this and having and trying to gather some understanding, it's like the innocent will be vindicated. It was like a rejoicing. It was, there was a joy in going with them. And I was like, I know that I'm going home now. It's just a matter of when. Mm -hmm. And now I have to understand what it is that I have to learn before because I realized that that's what the situation was about. It was about him sitting me down and making me realize that, hey, listen, I am. Wow. And it's exactly what he told us in the Bible. It's, he says, he told Moses, tell him I am. Wow. I am that I am. And wow. so, and, and I heard him. Wow. Wow. We have a caller who has a question that they like to ask, and we're going to bring them on the line. I believe we have Tiffany on the line. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Good evening, Pastor. Hi. How are you this evening? Okay, good. Thank you uh, so much, Obi, for bringing us into um, your journey. First, I want to say that. Yeah. Um, and while I was waiting, I think you actually just kind of touched a little bit on my, my question for you. I wanted to just ask you what was that humbling moment for you? And you said you just you you were sitting in the county and you read a scripture. Do you yeah. did you have God in your life before? Even when you were moving around, you know, had you yeah. ever been um, maybe in a in a Christian setting? You know, did you have any relationship yeah. with God, or was it just that moment when you were in lockup? And then after that, you know, once you read that scripture, was it an immediate? Uh, transformation, uh, immediate relationship, or how long did it take you to get to that humbling place of peace? Yeah, you know, you know, if it, if it was the Creator's will, it would have been a situation where it was immediate. There would have been rejoicing, but with all yeah. things, <laughs> with all things, it comes patience. It means that we have, it's the things that we have to learn. So no, it wasn't something immediate. But first, to your first question, yes, I was. I was raised in a Christian church. I was raised. Uh, I was raised at the church. I was raised in realizing that. There is a creator that was that sat in front that that's there. There is a Messiah that is there. I just I I growing and not and not involving my spirit in those in that in 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 that discussion of learning about the creator and about the Messiah was I found myself in a situation where I was back and I was separated because I wasn't I wasn't as strong as I should have been because I wasn't getting a, a, the exact nourishment that my soul needed. And so as I grew and I got to a point to where I began to start studying and, and reading and, and trying to find out for myself. And it was like, and it was, a, it was a truth that was there that, that I had never known. It was a truth that was there that had made, had made 
total sense to me. And I mean, <laughs> and you know, I, you know I, I laugh about it now because just a couple of days ago, I went to go see my psychiatrist, and I'm sitting down with him, and um, and he's asking me about, and, and we having this discussion about Valentine's Day, and and I'm telling him why I don't why I don't participate with those things, and he told me that I was that I was an unconventional thinker. He said that I have been out of space for 17 years. And now that I'm back, I'm around individuals who think conventionally while well, I'm thinking unconventionally, and I have to find a middle zone. Well, I say that wow. there is no lo- there is no lukewarm water. This is what I first my first thought was: there is no lukewarm water. There is only hot and cold. And because I stand against those things that everybody else stands for, it makes me realize that I trace the exact same purpose that my Messiah did, which is standing in the face of those things that I know that are wrong and say no. And so, um. And but it was just funny. It was funny because it was like uh for me, it was just like a confirmation. Everybody always say the same thing that I'm out there. And <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> I mean, and the only reason why I'm out there is because I am firm in what I know about my about my creator and I am firm in his in his word and in his truth. And I am firm in all of the dictates in which he tells me that I should and shouldn't do. And so now when I'm when I'm when someone comes to me with those things, it's like they don't understand. And, and I and I understand that, and it's not because it tells me too. It is it's not for everyone to understand, and I have no problem with that. You know, it's K Sarah Sarah. Wow, wow, Tiffany, we thank you for calling in this evening with your question. We hope that Obi was able to answer your question. Thank you, um, Obi. I yeah. I do have another question for you. Was there ever a time doing this? 17 year span that you said i'm giving up i'm still no. sitting here at the 17 years what am i <laughs> it, was there yeah. ever a time that you just wanted to say okay i'm here i'm gonna be here i'm giving up no no listen uh man uh and, you know a lot of times you know people ask me i'm always asked that i'm always asked that question whether or not was there a point in my state that i said man you know what this is it i'm giving up there is it's not going to happen. And I tell them, listen, you know, hard as it may be for people to believe, absolutely not. It was, again, I, it was a it was a strength that was poured within the wealth inside me from my creator. And it's made me, at each time that I got denied from the courts, become even stronger and that much more determined and that much more and striving towards him. Mm-hmm. And, what I, and that's what I realized is that the closer I got to him, the clarity, beca- everything became just that much more clear. I mean, people don't want, I tell them all the time, I pray for these things to happen. And I got the best legal team that I can possibly receive. I got a young lady named Lori Levinson, who was a lead federal investor, federal um, uh, prosecutor for many years. She counseled judges from the California Supreme Court all the way up. I got a legal team from the Northern Innocent Project that was remarkable in their writing, also one from Loyola. He surrounded me by a team of lawyers. And so when we went into the courtroom, it was as though I, I had all, I'm, I'm telling them, relax, listen, I declared victory Come years ago. Come on that's what I told. I, that's what I told them. Yeah. I told them I declared victory years ago. Wow. We were only going into the courtroom to allow for those things to manifest themselves in the display, in the, in, the, in, the, in the audience view, so that they could see the power of the Creator. Wow. They looked at me like they looked at me like, man, you know, they don't understand how can I be as strong as I was, even with the even understanding that the court system is subject to do anything. Wow. Listen, we have another caller, and we only have four minutes. We want to give this caller opportunity to ask the question. Um, we look like we have Byron on the line. Good evening. Good evening. How are you this evening? <laughs> I'm blessed, truly blessed. Good. You have yeah. a question for our guest this evening? Yes, I do. Uh, how you doing, Obi? I'm doing fine, yourself. Yeah. What obstacles and what adjustments have you had to make from coming from incarcerated to being back out here on the streets, and what was the biggest adjustment? Um, one of the biggest adjustments that I have to come to since being home is... uh. It's basically, it's, it's, it's almost trying to, it's almost like my psychiatrist said, having to try to find a middle ground with conventional thinkers, individuals who are who are in exact 
opposite of what I'm what I set out to do. And so uh it's that and it comes from being where I was. It comes from, you know, uh, being very, you know, have to analyze everything, have to overthink a whole lot of stuff because it was always about a safety and the security of one self present. You have to be self preservant. And so um and so now what that did for me was created a situation now to where it 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 made my thoughts where I'm always very questionable about people and their actions and why they do certain things. And so that's been very difficult. Um, finding work initially when I came home was really difficult because I had been gone for 17 years trying to explain the 17-year work gap history was 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 kind of difficult. It was it was only because of the efforts of the, um, the ACLU, which is the American Civil Liberty Liberty Union, and a young lady named Anna Zamora who uh, set out got me some work um, getting an initiative signed. They had an um, initiative out here in the state of California called Save California, and it was about repealing the death penalty in the state of California. So I started out going around getting initi- getting signatures, telling people about my story about being wrongfully incarcerated and how those things are possible and how easily someone could be ripped away from their family. So, And then, uh, and then from there... Uh, I then end up landing in another job. I end up getting another some more work with this group called Death Penalty Focus. They they have seen a couple of different um, events that I went and spoke at, asked whether or not if I was willing to go around and, and help their cause in regards to repealing the death penalty, not only in the state of California but period, and being a justice advocate. And I said absolutely, and things just kind of snowballing from there. I then uh, landed a job for the temp. What's it been a temp? At this warehouse, then I ended up getting work and getting work permanently. So, ultimately, what happened was uh, help, help, help. Wow. So, uh, wow. help, 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 and uh, someone came along, helped them to help me, and wow. so it was help just kind of like moved down the hill, wow. and it didn't work out that way. Wow. Listen, Obi, we have like a minute left to go, but can you tell our radio audience how they can be in contact with you, or if you just want to give them an encouraging word if they find themselves in a situation like this? Yes, they can. Um, they can. They can get in contact with me via my um, either from they can email me at Obi Anthony at Obi Anthony at Gmail dot com. And or and or they can either Facebook me at, at Obi Anthony, and I have a Facebook page, and you know we have an open discussion in regards to you know how how we can all find a place to where to, to where we can sit down, calm ourselves, tap into that strength that the Creator blesses us with. Right. Thank you again so much for calling for being a part of the Powerful Living Radio Show, and again thank the radio audience for tuning in today. God bless you and God keep you.